How you doing? Doing good? Staying cool? All right, Ephesians chapter 3, if you turn there in your Bibles or open up your apps to Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at the Passion Translation, and it starts with this. It says, Beloved friends, because of my love for Jesus Christ, I'm now his prisoner for the sake of all you who are not Jews. And today, as we continue our series, my title is Blessed by love, blessed by love. But first, a joke. An elderly couple had dinner at another couple's house, and after eating, the wives left the table and went into the kitchen. The two gentlemen were talking, and one said to the other, man, last night we went to a new restaurant that we just loved. And the other guy says, oh, you don't say. Well, what's the name of the restaurant? And the older man goes, um, uh. Uh, scratches his head. He goes, okay, what's the name of that flower you give to someone you love? You know, the one that's red and has thorns? The other guy says, oh, you mean a rose? He goes, yeah, that's it. Hey, Rose, what's the name of that restaurant we went to? <laughs> that's funny, guys. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> All right. You know, one of the truest ways to see what you love is what you're willing to suffer for, okay? Chick-fil-A. Uh, no, I, I like Chick-fil-A. I really like Chick-fil-A. I might have a restaurant crush on Chick-fil-A. But when I heard that, that there was a Chick-fil-A opening in La Mesa and the first 100 people in line would get Chick-fil-A each week for, for the next year, I was like, I can't do it. I'm not camping out, braving the San Diego cold nights, and going to stay up, lose sleep through the night. I, I love the chicken sandwich. I, waffle fries are amazing. Um, but like a real love, it's not there. Not willing to suffer. Okay. However, when a friend asked me if I was willing to do this, if I was willing to go out fishing with him, and, and I, was feeling, I was feeling bad. I was fighting the cold. Okay, the last time I had gone fishing, I had hurled over the side of the boat, like dealing with seasickness. Um, the waves were going to be big. In fact, we got out, and my back was like pummeled with pain. But you know what? I was, I was willing to suffer because I love fishing. Let me just show you a picture. Some of you that know me were like, I knew you were going to try to work this picture into a sermon. Look at that right there. That is a yellowtail. I love to fish, okay? And so it's worth it to, to deal with seasickness, to, to get beat up on the boat ride. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We're willing to suffer for what we love. And what we can't forget is that Paul, when he writes this book on Ephesians, which is all about blessing that he was in the midst of being in prison. He was in prison. So I, I started asking myself this week, when, when I study the Bible, one of the things you can do to, to really meditate and chew on it is take notes. So I'm always taking notes, and I'll ask myself questions. And so one of the questions I ask, I'd encourage you to ask yourself is, how have I suffered for Jesus? So let me just tell you, I'm not a master of suffering. I have some friends that are part uh, of our movement of churches like Dana Curry. She went to prison in Afghanistan for Jesus. Or a guy that was here in the spring, Dan Bauman, he was imprisoned in Iran. I have another friend that carries a cross around the world. He's been pelted with rocks. He's been run over. He's been beat up for Jesus. I started writing down how have I suffered. And I mean, there, was, there were some little things. I've had a lot of sleepless nights on overseas trips. I've, I've gone many days fasting not eating food. I've had some people say some mean things. I've had some people curse me out. I've had some people write things trying to destroy my reputation. But as I meditated on Paul's life, the author of Ephesians, I thought, man, my suffering pales in comparison. He says, three nights I was, I was shipwrecked and out on the open sea. Like, I think it's suffering when I'm a little seasick fishing for, for sports fish. He's out on the open sea. He says, I've been stoned, and not meaning like at a concert. 
right? He was like, I got pelted by rocks. I've been left for dead. I've been whipped. I've been lashed, right? I was in danger in the country, in danger in the city. So here's my next question. Write this down. What ways might you suffer for Jesus in the future? I started thinking about this, you know, some could lose their job. Some of you could be abandoned or ostracized by your family or friends. You know, for some, it might actually mean you're, you're, you're boldly speaking and, and you, you go to jail for what you believe. My question this morning is, do we love Jesus enough to suffer for him? Do we love Jesus enough to suffer for him? And do we believe he's worth it? Do we believe he's worth it? Because can I just tell you, in the midst of being in prison, Paul is telling us how blessed we are. So the the next question is, do you believe that in the midst of your challenges that you can be blessed? Do you believe when your circumstances are bad that you're actually blessed? Because what I don't want you to, to do is get the wrong idea about this series that Jesus is just like a, a pill that you swallow and he takes all the pain out of life. Right? Sometimes you, you, you hear sermons and you feel like Jesus is kind of like an exaggerated version of a genie in a lamp. That you just, you find him and then you just ask whatever you want and it just happens. Or Jesus is like your iPhone. He's just like there when you're bored and you need it, you pull up something fun. Right? That, that's not how Jesus is. But Jesus has a deeper blessing for each of us. And that's what this chapter is all about. Verse 2, so that you will hear the gospel that God entrusted to me to share with you for this wonderful mystery, which I briefly described was given to me by divine revelation. This blessing that we're talking about is a wonderful mystery, and it comes by divine revelation, so that whenever you read it, you'll be able to understand my revelation and insight into the secret mystery of the Messiah. There's never been a generation that's been given the detailed understanding of this glorious and divine mystery until now. He kept it a secret until this generation. God is revealing it only now to a sacred, uh, uh, not only now, to a sacred apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Here's the secret, the gospel of grace has made you, non-Jewish believers, into co-heirs of his promise through your union with him. And you have now become members of his body, one with the anointed one. For the last two weeks, we unpacked what Paul called the gospel of grace, this reality that although we're sinners, that we all fall short of the glory of God and we deserve to pay for our sin, that Jesus took our place. He died on the cross, taking our sins in his body on the cross so that that punishment for sin could be done away with once and for all in him. Then he rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death. And so the gospel's good news that sinners don't have to pay for their sin, that instead of going to hell and suffering forever, we go to heaven, paradise, and live with God. But can I tell you, that's not the end of the gospel. So many times we stop there. But here in Ephesians chapter 3 is the next part. I want you to highlight this phrase that says we have union with him. Like God didn't just do a transaction to save you from your sin. He actually wants to, here's the next phrase, be one with the anointed one. He wants you to actually be one with him. Like the living God, the king of the universe, wants you to actually be one with him. Paul explains it in another book, Colossians 1. He says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what sets this faith apart from all other religions is that you actually become one with the living God. Okay, so it makes me think of superheroes. You know, for years, back in my day, we had like four major superheroes that we focused on, right? Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and Wonder Woman, right? They had their own shows, you know, and you were so excited when they came out with their own movies. Have you noticed that now there's like a superhero a month. 
I'm serious. Like the most extraneous superheroes not only have their own television series, but they have movies. Like for crying out loud, Ant-Man just had a sequel Come on, Ant-Man. Like what kind of superhero is Ant-Man, right? Some of you guys are getting offended right now. Okay, you know you have an issue if you're offended when I'm talking bad about Ant-Man, right? <laughs> Ant-Man has a sequel. There are so, and here's why I think we're so into superheroes. I think actually that is something in us as humans that we get frustrated with our weaknesses and our inadequacies and our, and our failings. And so we think, how cool would it be if something in our nature actually changed and we were endowed with like supernatural abilities. And so we love vicariously living through superheroes that don't have to play by the same limits and laws as this natural world. Do you know that you do have a new nature? Amen. That you are endowed with power? So I'm, I'm, I'm flying back on a plane one time. I have my laptop open. I'm, I'm trying to do some work. And the, there's a screen in front of me, and they were playing the Fantastic Four. And I can't get any work done because I am just sucked into the story of these four normal scientists. Actually, I don't know if scientists are normal, but I'm, if you're a scientist, I love you. You're just so beyond me. So these four normal scientists who go through a cosmic cloud and their nature changes. And so where all of a sudden this normal guy can just turn into fire and fly around or this, this normal person can just go and, and reach and just stretch their arm. These crazy supernatural abilities. And I'm thinking, that's so cool. And then I realize, do you know, wait a second, this is my reality. Do you know that your nature changed? When you were saved, Jesus came into your life through the Holy Spirit. And, and try this one on for size. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I know how frustrating my mind could be. Like the average person has 12 to 60,000 60, thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. But you know, researchers say that for many people, 80% of your thoughts are negative. And let me just attest to that. From my counseling for a couple of decades with scores of people, I would say I find that true. That so many of us all day long are just having these negative nagging, you're not good enough, you always fail, your life stinks, you'll never amount to anything, no one likes you, you don't fit in, you're not pretty enough, you're not handsome enough, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough. We just have these thoughts, and, and oftentimes much worse. And then we have these greedy and judgmental and jealous and lustful thoughts, and you're like, oh, my mind is driving me crazy. Can I just tell you that you have the mind of Christ? And, and, and when I started walking in union with him, he started changing my thoughts to now I often, instead of just having a negative nagging thought, I'll be walking around and just start having positive thoughts and encouraging thoughts. Do you know why? It's because God is love. And so he's constantly pouring out his love, his encouragement, his kindness into my mind. Can I tell you that your whole mind can change as you walk in union with him? You have a new nature. You don't have to live in mental torment all the time anymore because you have the mind of Christ. And that's just one aspect of your new nature. Moving on, verse 14. So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your inmost being with his divine might and explosive power. Wow. Okay. We've got to get this, that Paul continues this revelation that God is a father. It's another way that, that, 
this relationship is so different than the world religions because all religions are man trying to get to this transcendent deity. But Paul is saying, no, what you have is a relationship with a father. And can I just tell you the, the demarcation of a father, the delineation, the delineating factor of a father compared to like a coach or a boss or an instructor or, or teacher, although a father can play all those roles, the thing that sets him apart, which is different, is a father just loves. Let me explain it this way. When my kids were born, I was there in the room. And they, it's not, if you haven't had kids, it's not like a, a little Charmin toilet paper commercial with this little fluffy baby that's all clean and, and plump. No, like babies come out of the womb and they're slimy and they have cone heads and they're, and, and and so it's not like gorgeous baby, but can I just tell you when they put that baby in my hands, I didn't have to go like, come on, work it up. Like, stir it up, heart. Come on. You got to love this kid. No, the second they put the baby in my hands, I'm like, oh, I love you. That baby had done nothing. It was just crying, it was dirty. One of my babies just started peeing, but I'm like, I love you. In the heart of a father is just love. Now, I know that some of you didn't experience that, and I'm so sorry for that, but can I just tell you that you do have a father that just looks at you the second you wake up, and he's like, I love you. I'm crazy about you and all your slimy cone-headedness. I love you. That's what Paul is saying. We're blessed by his love. He is a father. That's the primary revelation of God. He's not sitting back all the time just looking at you as a judge. Yeah, that's one of his roles, but his main role is father. Over and over again, he is father. That's why Paul says, I pray that he would unveil this to you. I pray that you'd have this unveiled. It's like we can live life with a, a bag overhead, like a veil over us. And that's why Paul keeps saying, I, I'm, I'm asking for this to be unveiled. And in chapter one, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open. I'm praying for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Can I just tell you one of the greatest prayers to pray over yourself is God, unveil my eyes and my heart. God, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Open up my heart so I can see. You ask God for the gift of God to see his love to experience his love. Parents, pray that over your kids. They need that more than any earthly success. They need a revelation of God's love for them because then they'll live out of love instead of live trying to gain love. Wait, did you hear that? That was good. You need to live out of the place of love instead of always trying to gain love. That's God's heart for you. That's his desire for you. That's what I pray for you, that's what I pray for me. God, I want a greater revelation of your love. Now look, what is our part? Here it is, verse 17. Look at verse 17. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you, and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. So here's an equation that I want you to get down. Here's the equation. First, constantly using your faith. Constantly using your faith. This isn't a religion. This is a life of faith. So we constantly use our faith. We respond in faith. When we do that, it says the life of Christ is released deep in you. And what happens? Then the resting place of his love becomes your source. Now, this is a little hard to understand. So let me explain it this way. When you gave your life to Jesus, when you accepted his forgiveness, he puts the Holy Spirit in you. You become a new person. And so the love and the life of Jesus is in you. It's like you have a gas tank in, in your life and it's filled up. But here's the thing. You have to do something to have that gas release. Let me, let me just uh, show you. Mitsu, can you help me out here? Here's Mitsu bringing up to me 
something that, that, an illustration that I think will help you understand that. Here is, one of you is going to go out to your car, and it's not going to work very well because I removed your gas tank. <laughs> and I'm just kidding. This is not your gas tank. But the life of Christ, when you gave your life to Jesus, it's like you have this tank in you, and he pours himself into it. It's poured into this. Now, here's the thing, though. You can sit in your car and never access the gas that's in this tank unless you do something. Everyone, take your foot, take your right foot, okay, and, and press it down on the ground. Press. Did you feel that? Did anyone fly forward at 70 miles an hour? No, it's ridiculous to think just by pressing your foot down that you can hurl yourself forward at 70 miles an hour. Do you know what I want to say? You are people of great faith. Because almost every day, every person in here almost is exercising faith that if you just push your foot down, you can propel yourself, and not just yourself, but a 3,000-pound hunk of steel and metal forward at, at 70 miles an hour. Right? But, but it's not just by pressing the floor. What are you doing? You're pressing this. You're pressing an accelerator. Now, it's silly. You're, you're barely putting any, you're just touching it. Plink, 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 right? Boop. Okay. Did I fly forward 70 miles an hour? Boop. Right? No. But what happened is this. When I press down this accelerator, something happens. There, there's a wire that's attached to a mechanism, and that mechanism, when it's activated, opens up a valve. All you're doing when you press in is you're opening. It opens up a valve, and what happens is a flow of air and gasoline comes in, and then it's ignited by a spark plug. And boom, there's an explosion. And you know what that explosion does? It sends down a piston, and that piston moves the crankshaft, and whoom, you propel forward. All through you choosing to act by faith, that if I touch this little pedal, bleep, 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 that I can hurl myself in this car at 70 miles an hour down the road. Isn't that amazing? You're a person of great faith. I bet you don't sit in the car and go like, oh, I don't know if it's going to happen. Oh, I don't know. No, I can't do it. No, you just exercise your great faith and go. <laughs> you know, that light turns green and you're like, here I come, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. You are a person of great faith. You press in, and, but all you're doing is just opening a little valve and letting something rush in. Do you know that when you exercise your faith, all you're doing is opening up your heart for the life of God to rush in? And then God does the rest. You did nothing to cause the spark and the explosion and, the, and all that force to propel you forward. All you did was exercise the faith. Can I just tell you, when you're hurting, Press in, exercise faith. All you do is say, God, I'm coming. And it opens up your heart and then his life can flow in. Let's give me to a hand. He's getting tired holding that gas tank. Can I just tell you, continually use your faith. How do you do that? You do it when things get rough and instead of saying, I'm gonna just turn to, to, to alcohol or drugs or this relationship or just uh, a media binge or whatever, instead you go, no, I'm exercising my faith. I'm crying out to God. Right? You're not making anything happen. You're just saying, God, I'm crying out to you. And it opens a valve that lets the life of God come in. It lets the life of God come into your life. When you're dealing with a broken relationship, you say, you know, I'm not just going to fight. and I'm just not going to get angry. Instead, I'm going to exercise my faith. And I'm just going to open up for the life of God. When you're dealing with a sickness, the first thing you do, God, I cry out to you. When, when, when your mind's a mess, another way to exercise your faith, pick up this book. 
and say, God, I'm just gonna believe this book. Another way to exercise your faith, just turn on your music. In the midst of your challenge, in the midst of your pain, just exercise your faith, press in, and say, God, I'm opening up to you, and let his love flood in. And then what happens is, boom, there's an explosion, and it propels you forward in your finances, in your challenges, in your trials, we exercise faith. I meet many people who go, I, I'm not experiencing the love of God. I, I, I don't experience the love of God. My question is, are you using your faith? Or are you just turning to the things of the world? All we do is use our faith. We open up our hearts to God so he can flood in. And then it says this, the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. You know, you experience God's love Enough that you just want to rest there. And you just start getting hooked. And you're just like, God, I don't want to leave your love. And then it becomes your resting place. It becomes your source. And that's how Paul could talk about blessing in the midst of being in prison. Can I just tell you, I'm not talking to anyone right here that's actually imprisoned and in chains today. You can be blessed no matter how challenging your circumstance is. Verse 18. Then you'll be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions, how deeply beyond measurement that transcends our own understanding, this extravagant love pours into you until you're filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Now that's a blessed life. You're overflowing with the fullness of God. You know, when we use our faith and God's love rushes in, and then it says, then we're empowered to discover more of his love. Isn't that crazy? The, the journey of life is about experiencing more of God's love. It's, it's kind of like a family vacation. Have you ever noticed we make plans? You, you try to go see something great. Maybe it's the Great Canyon. Maybe you go up to see the Sequoias. Maybe you're going to, to, to see the Statue of Liberty. But in the end of the day, what a great family vacation is actually if the family enjoyed the family. A point of a family vacation, you, you go to see some sites, but at the end of the day, the sights are secondary. The love of the family is primary. And that's what God's saying this life is all about. The primary purpose of your life. And if you get this, you'll know that you're blessed. The primary purpose of your life is to experience the love of God. And no one can take that away from you. So, for us that are, are, are more like, doers and task-oriented and achievers, maybe you're an achiever on the strength finders test like I am, there's still something great for you here. Because you're thinking like, Robert, this is all sappy, love, love, love. You keep talking about love. And like, I don't just watch the Hallmark Channel, you know. I want to watch the World Cup and action and do something and build HGTV, build something, right? And you... You're, you, let me just tell you, there's something here for you. It says this, now to him who is able to do, now him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. Let me just tell you this. If, if the goal of your life is to win the next game, like that's the goal of your life, you might as well just go and make an idol and bow down to it because that's idolatry. If the goal of your life is just to, to get a higher paying job, you might as well just walk into a temple of another religion and just burn incense in it because that's idolatry. If the whole goal of your life is I just want to get married, you might as well just take a, a lump of clay and form it into a statue and, and start singing to it because that's idolatry. But winning a game, getting a, a, a great paying job, getting married, those are not bad things. They just need to be secondary. They can't be your whole goal in life. Amen. And that's why the Bible says seek first the kingdom of God. And then all the other things will be added to you. 
God's not wanting to hold back good things from you. He just doesn't want that to be your God. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then he says, if you'll walk in union with me, if you'll make experiencing my love and walking in my love your primary objective, then watch, I can actually do immeasurably more than you can think or imagine. Like, who can do more? You working with all your little might or the living God? Here, here's a little illustration from our own church's history. I was willing to, to get a building. See, we, we have to have a, a building for this church. We're not, we don't have this forever. We've moved so many times. And so I was willing to have any place. And so you, the, we were looking at all kinds of old, decrepit buildings that no one else wanted. And I was great with that. I was just, God, give us a space. I just want a little space in the worst places, the hardest to find, most most hidden places. I was just great with that. And then all of a sudden, I'm sent this this email with this unbelievable land on the 8 freeway where a quarter of a million people passed by right across from San Diego State with this unbelievable opportunity to build. And I feel like God says to my heart, that's it. And I'm thinking, no way. No way, that is so beyond what I would have ever dreamed. And then someone steps up and in one day gives $1.5 million to buy that land like that. And then we get to start designing our own building to custom craft for all our children's ministries and our, our presentations and to actually build something for generations with a prayer tower in it and all. And I'm like, no, this is so far beyond, God, what I would have ever dreamed of. Kendall and I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to meet with Cindy Jacobs, and she's one of the most known prophetic ministers, maybe in the world right now. So we had this hour just us with her, she starts talking about all these things that have happened in the past of our church, like the inner workings. She had no idea besides God just speaking it to her, and then all the things that would happen in the future. So we're just in awe. And then she goes, you know, you guys have dreamed big. I'm thinking, yeah. She goes, you know, you thought some of those dreams wouldn't come to fruition, but God is saying your dreams are too small. She says, you know why? It's because God is the God who does immeasurably more. He is the God who does immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Do you know why? Because when God does what only he can do, he gets all the glory for doing it. Because no one can take credit. It says this, now to him who's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. If you will focus your life on loving God and walking in union with him and receiving his great love for you and consistently using your faith through the challenges and trials and circumstances of life and to say, God, really the journey is about walking in love with you, not accomplishing something. God says that I will do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. And when I do it in your little life, I'm gonna be glorified through it. Because people are going to look at your life and say, you could have never done that. And you're going to say, you're darn right, I couldn't have, but I've got a good God. Let's stand up.